This video is about making circuit boards. And there are a few different ways to make circuit boards. Probably the most common is by using a printer and uh, etching away the, the, the copper with chemicals. But another way you can create these routings is by using uh, an isolation milling. So you can actually mill away the copper where you don't want it to be. Of course, you can also have uh, your circuit boards made professionally. Uh, there are a lot of places that will do so for fairly cheap and have reasonable turnaround times of only a few days, but sometimes you want to experiment with something and it's going to take you a few different tries and you know you're going to fiddle with it a few times, so it's it's not something you want to wait days for. So in those cases, you might want to actually just make the circuit board at home so you can iterate on it a few times. So you will need some kind of milling machine. The one I have here I put together from parts that were left over from upgrading my uh, OpenBuild's mini mill. This just runs Gerbil with an Arduino controller and has a simple Makita router spindle. You need to have some board stock. So this is fiberglass board covered by a thin layer of copper. You need to have some drills for making the through holes in the board. And you need some end mills for cutting uh, out around the board. And then you need to have some kind of tool to actually do the isolation routing for all of the different circuit board traces. There are a few different options. Uh, you can use these very uh, extreme 10 degree angle V bits. Those can make very small traces, but sometimes making very small traces isn't what you want because I don't have any good way yet to make solder masks at home. So it's really easy to accidentally solder across very fine isolation routing. So instead I actually like to use these 60 degree V bits because they make a little wider trace without having to go too deep. That makes it easier to solder to. So I'll assume that you already have your circuit board designed in something like KiCad or Eagle, and then you can export from those programs to the files that you need to be able to do the essentially cam for the drilling and isolation routing and the cutout. This is an example from KiCad where I'm doing the uh, exporting. They call it plotting. You can generate the drill files. As well as all the geometry for whichever layers you want. In this case, I actually had some of my cutouts on one of the other layers. And then the next tool to use is called FlatCam. FlatCam is a really nice, pretty easy to use tool where you can load in these geometry files, these Gerber files. And then you can perform operations on those to create routing. So here I'm adjusting the isolation routing parameters, generating those isolation routes. Uh, in this case, I had a copper pour for the whole board. And so that has created uh, an extra isolation route around the outside. FlatCam has done that. But it is possible to just go in and delete that from the isolation routing geometry that you've created. If you don't have a copper pour on the board, you, you won't have to deal with this. Uh, and then you need to make sure you have your settings for the tool size and cut Z setup, and then you will be able to generate the CNC job object, which actually is the thing that will generate the G code. And then it also shows a visualization of where the toolpath is going to go which is nice so you can see about how much copper is going to be left over. So now I'm opening the Gruber file for the cutout. There's a special cutout tool in FlatCam. You have to make sure you select the correct geometry object. Uh, I like to set mine up without tabs, what they call gaps. 
So it just cuts all the way around because I'm actually uh, holding the board down to the um, fixture plate with double-sided tape. So it'll stay stuck down even after I cut through the uh, edges. And then again, like before, you can generate the CNC job and generate the G-code for that. All right, so next we're going to open the drill files. These are all the through holes for the board. Blackcam has a nice way of allowing you to group some of them together because in this case there were 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 1 millimeter sized holes. I only have a 0 0.8 and a 1 millimeter sized drill. So what I had to do was uh, first take the 0 0.8 millimeter sized holes, generate the G-code for those, with the correct depth and everything to uh, cut through the board. And then next I selected both of the both the 0.9 and the one millimeter holes and set those up to be cut with my one millimeter drill. So I'm cutting uh, some of the holes slightly oversize, but that's okay. And then next, I'm going to actually bring those CNC files into BCNC, which is the CNC controller I like to use. I'm connecting to my Arduino board and setting up the units. And then the next thing I'm doing is I'm just jogging the machine over to the uh, location where I want to start making my cuts and getting it so that it's close to uh, the board, but uh, not actually touching it. I'm going to zero everything out there, zero my coordinate system, and then I'm going to use probing to actually find out where the board is exactly. Uh, and the way that this works is you s you can get a lead that's hooked up to the copper circuit board, and then you get a lead that's hooked up to your tool. And when you put the probe in, when you click the probe button, it will go to that probe location. In this case, it'll try to go down to minus 0 0.3 at XY00 because I've entered there. And it will continue moving slowly down until it actually senses that there's a connection between those two leads. And if everything works correctly, <laughs> it will stop. And then you can zero there and you know that you're exactly at the point where the tool is on the board. Once everything's zeroed, I jog back up. And I next the next step is to do auto leveling in a grid over the location where I'm going to be milling. So to do that, I now need to open the isolation routing G code. Getting the zero point is extremely important and it's very hard to do because the copper layer is very thin and you don't want to cut too deep and you don't want to cut uh, too light um, because they both have problems. So you want it, you want it to be perfect. And part of that is um, leveling it using the auto leveling here. So now I'm going to hit the margins button, which will use the, the total bounds of the uh, cut I'm going to make as the extents of the grid. And then you can choose how many points you want in X and Y for the leveling grid. For here, I'm just using three by three. This is a pretty small little circuit. Uh, it's only gonna be about an inch by an inch. So uh, three by three is more than enough. And then you can put in the, the Z height range here to define how far you want it to start each time when it's probing down. 
And if you know you're already pretty flat, you could actually use a smaller value there to save some time. Once you've got the probe feed set up, you can, you can hit scan, and that will actually then start moving at each location. So you see it's moved to the first location. It's gone up to the Z height of 0 0.1, and it started moving down. And it's going to keep going until it finds 0. Once it does, it'll stop. It'll record that value. And it'll move on to the next location and do it again. And it'll just build up uh, all of these green values that represent offsets for each point on the grid. Fast forwarding a little bit, this is after it's all done, we've got all the points zeroed. And then the final step here I'm doing is to double check that my zero is correct by just going to the first location of the grid, which happened to be the position that it left the machine in, and probing down from there uh, to the board to make sure that I get something very close to zero, because I just did my auto leveling here, so I should be able to probe down and get about the same value unless something is wrong. So as you can see, I ended up at zero again, it ended up being perfect. Sometimes it's off by half a thousandth or something, that's fine. Re-zero, uh, and then in the auto level section, there's a zero button, which seems to be important to click. I think this might be what actually adjusts your G-code up to those, uh, to, that, to that grid that you've selected. So next I'm jogging up, I'm detaching the clips. It's very important to detach the clips before you turn on the spindle. Um, you don't actually need to detach the other one, just want to get the one off the spindle. And then I start the routing. And you might be able to see it, but uh, I had a problem here with the Z heights. Uh, the way I've got the, the board attached down to the machine right now is with some not very sticky double-sided tape on some MDF, uh, which has been used and has had some water exposure, and so it's not very sticky, and as a result, uh, every time the machine goes down to start doing some routing, it actually pushes the board down a little bit. So I wasn't getting a very good consistent Z height here. And I had to actually make some other attempts at this uh, to get a better result. I'll just fast forward through the rest of this. So after that's done, uh, the next thing I'm going to do is load up my uh, drill file. And so it'll ask if I want to reset my um, auto leveling data, which I don't want to do. I want to keep all that auto leveling information. Now I've got my drill loaded up in the machine, and I'm going to zero the drill because the tool length is going to be different. So I go to my uh, location that I've been zeroing at, which is just the bottom left corner of the auto level grid, and probe down once I get it close. So then after zeroing, uh, I can go and run the program.
I've kind of skipped around a little bit in the footage here just because I had several different attempts to try to get my Z height correct and I actually, like I mentioned earlier, I have two drill sizes that I need to use and I'm only showing one here because the other size is identical uh, in process. And then once we've got the isolation running done and the holes drilled, we can uh, route out the edge of the board. And the process again is similar. I want to keep my auto leveling information, uh, but I need to re-zero the tool length. And then when this goes, I uh, just do the full depth of the board in one go. This does create a lot of fiberglass that is flying around in the air, so you really do want a sealed enclosure here because this is uh, not good for your lungs. Uh, after going around once, it leaves a lot also of the sort of fringes of the cut. Uh, it's not a very clean looking cut. So I'll usually run the identical cut a second time and it'll clean up some of that uh, debris that's just in the cut. And then this is what it looks like after it comes off the machine and you can see that it's created basically some burrs around the edges. Um, and this is because, uh, you know, it's an upcutting end mill. It's going to do this. So I just have a file and file it down along the edges and the result is much cleaner. It's pretty easy to do. The, the burr comes right off. And I've uh, got a couple examples here. One done with a 10 degree V-bit and one done with a 60 degree V-bit. And the 10 degree V-bit result is very clean uh, and has very fine isolation widths. The problem with it, like I mentioned earlier, is it can be very hard to uh, to solder afterward because the solder um, uh, it, it's able to run over the isolation routing pretty easily compared to the 60 degree view bit with a little bit wider line. And that's it. I hope this was useful. Uh, part of the reason I did this is just because I do this rarely, but it's a pretty complicated process. And so I, I did this partly just for myself so that I have this documented for the future. But I thought it might be helpful for someone else out there who's trying to do this. Some of the gotchas are just pay a lot of attention to your Z height and make sure if, if you're getting weird inconsistent results, like it seems like the bit isn't cutting right or it's cutting too deep, um, it might be that it's shifting as you're cutting it. So uh, make that board as stable as possible in the machine. Another gotcha is just the fact that um, when you want to design things naturally, you kind of want to do it with a nice copper fill region for the ground plane. And it results in this kind of a board design where you have these thermal relief pads for the ground plane that are not always uh, very easy to solder to. And it can create uh, a lot of these double line situations where you have uh, double isolation routing in some areas that uh, can leave a small trace bit of copper on the on the board and it can result in some shorts. This also doesn't give you any margin for error uh, while you're soldering. If you solder something and you cross over to the ground plane then uh, you're done because now you've shorted something to ground that shouldn't have been shorted to ground. An alternative way to do this is to not use a copper pour and not use a ground plane. You tend to get a little cleaner isolation routing behavior because uh, flat cam isn't creating double lines around some areas and you also have a little bit of margin for error because if you accidentally solder something to the board uh, that's okay you have one freebie because it was floating before and now you've just tied it to something and then you can go and <laughs> as long as you don't mess up more than once on the board you're okay uh, and you don't have to try to wick the solder away and then if you don't want to leave the board floating you can always go in at the end after you've verified everything is is good and uh solder across one of the uh, one of the traces that's ground uh, to ground the, the board to the ground plane. And that's it. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. Uh, hopefully this works for you. It can be a little finicky, but it's uh, it's fun when it works right.